Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. How the devil are you? It is the end of a very, very long week. I know uh, if you've been enjoying all of the festivities of uh, 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 Tech Ed Week, uh, it's been fantastic. Tech Ed, God, blow Ed Tech Week. There we go. Uh, my name's Dave Coplin. I'm going to be your host for a fabulous live stream. We are exploring every crevice of creativity, bringing it into the curriculum. And why are we here? Well, for many of us, we're here uh, for this gentleman, actually, this fantastic gentleman who taught so many of us uh, to appreciate the beauty of creativity. And for my mind, um, his inspiration, his legacy to me, uh, is he's the patron saint of, for just bloody God's sake, would you do the right thing in terms of helping our kids acquire the skills, the skills that they're gonna need to be successful in the world, that, the future that they're actually gonna inherit, which by the way, isn't the world that we inherit today. It's a very different place. And so this is for you, Sir Ken. Uh, this is for you, creative people. This is for you in education. Uh, we wanna hear from you. We want to have you as part of the conversation. We want you dialed in. Uh, we're on the chat line as well. So we're watching your comments come through. So hi, Richie. Hi, Jazz. Hi, Genevieve. Hope you're all doing good. Um, the format for today is essentially we're going to run through. We've got a lineup of amazing, inspirational people who are doing incredible things, smashing together the world of technology and creativity in all sorts of amazing ways. Uh, we're going to hear a little one, a little bit from each of them as we go through the first session. We're going to have a very short intermission, just give you time to go and grab a drink, whatever it may be. It's Friday night, knock yourselves out. Um, and then we're going to go straight into a panel conversation with a few of our guests talking through what might be possible. So again, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, I'd now like to bring in our first guest, who is Max Wheeler. Max, how are you doing, my friend? Hello. Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, nice to be here. So Max is the program director of uh, VIP Studio Sessions at Churanga Music and author of Multimedia Youth Music Materials. Tell us more about that, Max. Yeah, so I mean, I suppose the easiest way to describe what I do is that I'm a music producer, sort of first and foremost. That's what I do. Um, kind of day in day out I'm based in my studio um, but really what, what's happened is my sort of journey as a producer led me into education and I sort of I found this kind of landscape where the sort of stuff that I do so kind of you know electronic music new types of music was just really difficult for young people to access in education um, and working with Taranga, Taranga an amazing uh, company who sort of specialise in e-learning and music um, and I, I basically kind of took on the mantle of trying to develop um, cloud-based uh, resources for schools to allow them to teach things like, you know, like grime music, uh, hip hop music, electronic music, um, pop music, sort of new styles of music that young people are really into. Um, and that when I meet young people, the kind of music that they ask to learn about, um, we were just looking at ways of, you know, bringing that to more young people, making that more accessible, making it available as well even if teachers aren't necessarily that confident in delivering that style of music themselves so it's kind of really just allowing young people to engage with the types of music that they're really interested in um and yes yeah, so it's become a kind of big passion of mine um, and what's really nice is that i'm still doing both of those things so i'm still you know an artist signed to a record label releasing records um, and we're trying to really bring a bit of that music industry real world approach into the classroom basically so actually exactly like you were saying in the introduction there the kind of skills you're actually going to need to release records yeah. to be a, a, an artist in the current world instead of it being like right we're going to start with music theory and we're going to talk about you know baroque loop music and how to har how to harmonize a sack but <laughs> um, i'm saying okay well what's the what's the kind of music you might actually hear on spotify this week and how do you make it no, I, I love that. And, and also what I think so important um, with that is, you know, I think technology in particular offers us a whole new interface in, into music mm. um, that I think is important to explore as well. And so I think helping people connect, you know, the music they hear with different techniques in a way that you're doing is just is so, so important. I, I also think music is so important as part of, you know, being the hook for people. Funnily enough, one of the people who I can already in the chat is a very good friend of mine. Um, It's all gone quiet. Oh, hello. Yeah, I'm still here. Still there. Excellent. Sorry, yeah. it all went quiet for a minute. But um, it's a very good friend of mine, who, uh, Richie Prynne, who is uh, just the most wonderful musician. And what I love about Richie's story is, you know, the bit at school that really, truly engaged him was music. And, and, and I think he got really lucky with a great music teacher who could see that in him. And whilst he would not sort of engage in the same way in his academic subjects, it showed him a pathway, you know, to, to utilise his creativity, to create something that, and, and now, you know, he's doing amazing, you know, in his own right as a musician. 
question. So it's just wonderful that you, you're able to do that. Yeah. How, how do the kids sort of engage with it? How do they, how do they receive it? Yeah, it's well, really popular. Um, and I think one of the big things is that what we're seeing a lot of is really big mass scale projects, especially at Key Stage 3, where we've, say, got four or 500 young people in a year group all creating their own track. So creating a piece of house music, creating a piece of grime music, real kind of like large scale engagement. And I think like you were saying, the key really is that the new technology, cloud-based technology, what we're really looking at is browser-based technology and um, using browser-based technology to make it free at the point of access for the young people. So it's removing the economic barriers, it's removing the technical, technological barriers, and um, it's allowing access to that, um, that platform for all of the young people that we work with. And that then means that what we're seeing is real like mass engagement, um, especially say like lots of young women engaging with music technology, because actually when you remove the technological barriers, it turns out that women do want to make beats. Um, we're seeing lots of young people from sort of disadvantaged backgrounds, um, say young people who may be harder to reach, maybe wouldn't normally consider themselves a candidate to do music GCSE. We've seen a lot of people actually checked up. Um, it's really, it's really exciting. And I think the example that I quite often give is it's a bit like if you want a young person to learn the cello, historically, the music service has to lend them a cello and they go away and learn to play it. But with music producers or pop singers um, or, you know, beat makers, we expect them to, you know, use a computer in an IT suite for one hour a week when they're in their music lesson and somehow yeah. learn to be a producer. And it's like, you can't do it. If you want to learn to produce music, you need to be able to access that outside of school. And that's what the cloud and the browser-based stuff has allowed us to do. So here's a login. You can use it at home. You can put in as much time as you want. Um, and we're really seeing that. We've, so we've just had our first producer get his first release on Sony Records. Um, oh, wow. And this was a kid who was really struggling in year seven and is now releasing on major labels. Um, and I mean, we've, we've had some great interviews and stuff with him. And that's, that's the thing we're trying to do is say, right, here's the tools go away, get, get creative, get involved. And actually here's the links into the industry as well. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's exciting stuff. And I think it, I think it definitely, definitely links into a lot of the kind of themes you're talking about today in terms of there are ways to be creative. And a lot of, a lot of that is to do with new technology, giving us new options that weren't there five years ago, even two years ago, there's, there's opportunities now to make this stuff widely available. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting stuff. No, I love that, Max. Now, listen, we're, we're going to sort of rattle through. So we're going to crack on to our next guest, but I know you're going to be mm -hmm. back with us um, for the panel discussion. So thanks for joining us, yeah. Max. We'll come back to yeah. you later on. My pleasure. So next up, sorry to cut you off there, Max. I'll work on my timing because we'll get better as the show goes on, I promise. Um, so next up, we've got Joe Moretti. Now, Joe is a Apple Distinguished Educator uh, for Worldwide iPad and Education. Uh, he's a music technology specialist and another pro musician. How the devil are you, Joe? Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, hi, Dave. Thanks for having me. It's really good that you could be here. Now, uh, Joe, we've got a video from you, so I'm just going to cut straight to the video and then we'll come in for, for a chat. How's that? Uh, sounds Perfect. good. Now, I'm going to say roll VT, which is uh, really unnecessary because there's nothing to roll and it's there's no tape. Old style, isn't it? It is, but it's more exciting than saying press the button. Go on, say it, it anyway. Got, go on, roll VT. There we go. So with this short video, I just want to demonstrate what I'm looking for in terms of uh, bringing uh, software into the classroom. I'm obviously looking for creativity. Um, I'm looking for inclusivity. And I'm also looking for differentiation right across the board in terms of genre and the ability of my students. So I'll start with a, uh, a keyboard just to demonstrate a couple of key points. So here we have... GarageBand on the iPad and I can immediately change between a traditional keyboard um, where, one which I have the option of putting the note names on as you can see or indeed this one which is a smart keyboard I'll explain the difference very quickly um, with this I'd need to be able to play a chord and know what goes into that if I connected up a MIDI keyboard that's a traditional keyboard a student who has that technique would be able to play all of these sounds from a traditional keyboard. A lot of students don't have that. So this smart keyboard is wonderful for working with chords, left hand and right hand, just by tapping on the screen. For students who find that difficult, I also have this autoplay feature, which will play different patterns for me. So I'm going to record that very, very quickly and just demonstrate how I can explore chords with very little chord knowledge.
So look, I'm, I'm going to cut back uh, to you, Joe, because that's a great example of what we were just talking about with Max, isn't it? And I just, I love GarageBand for just bringing that accessibility, especially to young people. In in the, It's kind of instant gratification, isn't it? It must be so rewarding to be able to do that. Um, I think, I mean, one of the things I was trying to show with that video was that I can work at any level. I started teaching music in 1982. And the thing was, the facilities at that point was, if you were going to play keyboard, you needed to have keyboard technique. And so this whole idea of inclusivity, differentiation, and, and trying to get away from this idea that music was this special thing that only a certain group of people could do. And even then, sort of 20 years later, when we were working in Logic, and a lot of students were into drum and bass and house music, we were accessing making music through a sort of matrix editor, which was really unmusical the thing is that we've got to a point now that software really should be truly intuitive for students to literally be touching sound and creating sound and we want as little distance as possible between coming up with the creative process or the thought and realizing it we're very lucky actually i mean we're doing all of this on a piece of glass it's crazy isn't yeah it, it is it's, it's mad but the but the uh, for me it's the accessibility. It's funny enough. I've just been my son's just been doing uh, music theory grade five, right? And so I've been trying to, right. uh, and it's it's impenetrable, uh, you know, to the to the layperson. Do, do you know what I mean? It's just it's hard work. And I, I can help him with well, his math. I can yeah. help him with his physics. I, yeah. I was like, seriously, dude, yeah. you are on your own. And and I just think the well, you're looking at gift... someone who grew up with it. Yeah. So right. for me, I was very lucky. My father was a great session uh, guitarist and I grew up on, on theory and jazz theory. So it was instilled wow. in me, but I was so aware. Uh, I'm, I'm, my, I'm my kind of whole background is classical, then moved into jazz and then moving into uh, music technology. But the thing is that working with students, um, you're so aware that the range within music is vast. And yeah. Max referred to the cellist and I'm thinking about a cellist compared to somebody that wants to get into uh, creating their, their own music without actually going through an instrument. You're right about grade five theory, you know, how many sharps and what minor and all the rest of it. And I feel the same way about music theory in terms of, well, I work with a lot of schools that work with Sibelius, for example. And the yeah. first thing about Sibelius is really, if you can't read music, you're not gonna be able to use it. Yeah. So I often get asked, um, can you bring GarageBand in to give me entry at the lowest level? And how far can I go with that? Yeah. The crazy thing about GarageBand with, on an iPad is it can really match 80 to 90% of um, exam level music from 14 to 16. Okay, it doesn't yeah. do notation, but it does just about everything else. Um, it does things that we were trying to do with software 30 years ago, and it does it yeah. for free. I'm not just an advocate of garage band, by the way. I'm an advocate of whatever works. Yeah, well, but but you see, that's why I think this stuff's so important because mm. for me, it's all about um, it's getting them hooked. And and I think to get young minds hooked. And I have this in in computer science, right? That's that's my uh, art, if you like. Um, if if they can't make something happen, if they can't engage with it and do something in the physical world, it's actually really really hard to to maintain their interest. And and so I kind of like the bait and switch, if you like, of things like you know Garage Band, but also you know other tools like Reason, even uh, Ableton, mm -hmm. is is yeah. it's enough to get you started. And and then once you get to a level, in this whole new world of complexity opens up but by then you've got the confidence that you know enough about how it works to be able to engage them further and and again you know isn't it wonderful it's against the context of music right which is such a rich uh, creative thing anyway the thing is i mean looking at garage band and and a lot of people do use it and then they say oh but it would be nice if it had orchestral instruments because i have these sort of students and I go, well actually if you looked under other <laughs> you'll find every orchestral <laughs> instrument. And go, oh my heavens, it's got French horns. It's got pizzicato strings. Yep, it's got everything. It, 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 it's a crazy piece of software. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Uh, listen, Joe, it's absolutely wonderful for you to join us. And so thanks so much for sharing that that's with us. It's a pleasure. Uh, so uh, with no further ado, we're going to move on to our next guest. It feels like we're getting through quite quickly, which is wonderful just to have so much amazing talent with us. Um, so our next guest is Erin uh, Corder, who is the assistant head teacher at Denby High School and, and developing a creative arts curriculum. Erin, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks. How are you? 
Yeah, really, really, really good. Um, what would you like to do? Should we go straight to your video uh, to set the scene? Is that? Yeah, I think possible? so. Okay, so um, we're going to run some more VT. Hey, hey. Uh, and then we'll be right back with you to talk through, Erin. Thank you. Every opportunity we celebrate on our website, we celebrate in our news. Welcome to a whistle stop tour on how to develop a school culture that values the arts. Uh, a little bit about the context of Denby. It's important to note that 38% of our students are from a disadvantaged background, with 99% of students from minority ethnic backgrounds, resulting in 95% of our students who are EAL. I think it's important that you start with your vision. As a school leadership team, as a head teacher, I think that you start with your vision of what you think are the values that you want your students to leave with. And here we're very proud to say that we want positive influences on the local, national and global stage when creativity lends itself to a wider, wider understanding of these things. And then respectful and creative young adults with an enthusiasm and thirst for their next chapter in life. At our school, we have a sustained commitment to developing teachers. I think that this is incredibly important. You want to put the best teachers that you can find in front of your students. That means that you have to really look at recruitment and retention of these people um, <laughs> and ensuring that they are then grown and developed. This is something at Denby that we've done in the arts team incredibly well uh, and beyond. You want a rich and varied curriculum that offers alternative pathways. So are there any other alternative qualifications that would be suitable for the needs of your learners? Um, thinking creatively about the things that you can offer. And then probably one of the most important things is offering a program of extracurricular activities. Where is the opportunity for them to be intellectually curious beyond the classroom? So we started in the arts with our key stage three offer. We looked at art and drama and at key stage four, we offer media. What we did was we combined our music, design technology and media key stage three offer to create a subject called production studies. This really is a mix of all three subjects and prepares them well for that transition into media. Rather than have them as isolated subjects, we've decided to brand them as the arts faculty almost, so that you can identify, so the students can identify where these artistic and creative opportunities are taking place. You will see that we've mapped from year seven up to year eight, and then the transition into year nine. They can see what subjects and what topics they will be studying and, and relate it individually to each of those three areas. Anything that is in orange, is a club that is there to supplement the curriculum. And these are not only run by teaching staff, but we have non-teaching staff. We have a receptionist that runs a club. Anybody who can offer you that creative expertise to enhance uh, the learning of our children. Um, so I'm just going to uh, cut back in uh, to talk to you, Erin. That sounds amazing. How, how long have you been developing that for? Um, so I think production studies has been running for four years now. Um, and it has been uh, sort of involved in for a period of time to the uh, qualification that it is now. And we're always reviewing the curriculum to look where we can ensure that there is a, a certain breadth for our students. Um, it's interesting listening to uh, Max and Joe because the buzzword really does seem about access. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. We as a school, we, we've worked really, really hard to ensure that the technology is there, that the software is there to, and you know, it's funny you talk about GarageBand and Logic and, you know, they, they're used consistently in our production studies. But again, using that as part of our music offer, you know, we don't have yeah. an explicit music teacher. And I, and I reinforce uh, the point made in the presentation about when you get your great teachers, you've got to keep hold of them and you've got to grow them and you've got to develop them. You put great teachers in front of children who are so hungry to learn and so enthusiastic and, and so malleable, um, you know, you're going to get great results. So um, where we didn't uh, have a sort of explicit mu music offer, we combine that with uh, design technology as well to put together this kind of music production that I, I think Max was talking about um, that sounds very, very similar. And we use that as a sort of stepping stone into GCSE media and production. And um, it's really, really a kind of amalgamation of all the skills that they will need uh, at that key stage four. 
Um, another example would be, for example, uh, we reviewed our art and design offer so that we could uh, introduce an element of textiles for the students. Again, thinking about that as a design technology offer and that element of creativity, but upskilling our students, um, giving them something different, giving them something that is relevant to their needs. Lots of our students spoke about a desire to pursue fashion um, uh, and, and that, those elements of creativity. And uh, so we reviewed our curriculum and we looked at it and we upskilled our teacher and teachers. Um, and then the big, big thing when we're talking about the access and the accessibility it is putting on your clubs and your, your extracurricular opportunities for those students. Um, I think the sort of stepping stone to that, you know, we said they've got to do it outside of lessons. They've got to do it outside of lessons. Well, we create those opportunities in school. We create that with our lunchtime clubs, with our after school clubs. And, and there's a real commitment and dedication and a buy in there. Um, we, we spoke about celebrating the arts and celebrating the things that the students have done and rewarding them. We've had afternoon teas where we've invited their parents in to come and share and listen to their music or, or, or look at the sewing that they've created. Or um, We've held free arts, art exhibitions within the community. Uh, we've taken children who were keen on singing, we've taken them to the local hospital to sing. We've taken a couple of our children who went to keyboard club down to the local care home to go and perform for the church. Obviously, this is pre-COVID, of course. Um, but it's that kind of energy and commitment to the arts that really does create the buzz and, and the culture of value that surrounds it. Yeah, no, I, I love that, Erin. And I love the fact that you've taken such a sort of a, a holistic approach when it comes to the staff and getting them involved. It's funny, one of the messages that's just come in again from from Richie, who is a professional musician now, and what he's talking about, how it was uh, funny enough, because he started with Garage Band and then progressed to Logic, um, the right. music department didn't really engage with him because he wasn't doing proper music. Uh, but it's actually was the drama teacher who who saw the talent, who saw the opportunity, and, and connected that. And I think it's just it's so important, is it, to have everybody thinking really broadly. And, and for me as a technologist, the, the sort of the thing that I really would love people to do, and people like you and, and and everybody on the call is, you know, we put technology in this box and it's about coding and it's and it's and you know there's a bit of technology that is about that. But technology for me is just this wonderfully creative canvas and it unleashes talent in all sorts of directions and so to have someone like you who recognizes that and can build that with your staff to to tease that out of of the kids is just such a wonderfully sort of huge opportunity to be able to have that's great and that, that's lovely to hear i mean there's so much overlap you know our drama productions it involves the whole arts team it involves all of yeah. us and our arts team is relatively small but we're growing now um and 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 we we you will have seen our sort of logo and our emblem and we've branded ourselves and they're not these standalone departments anymore. We're absolutely a, a united team and, and drive the creative strands across the school. Yeah, no, exactly. But but also if you if you think about it, and I know we've we've seemed to have um fixated on music a lot, and I don't mean to, mm -hmm. but it's such a great example. If you think about today's musicians, it's not enough that they're great musicians. They also mm -hmm. have to uh, be artists, they have to be great in design. They've got to think about photography and filming because they're actually doing all of this themselves mm -hmm. in, in today's world. They're creating their videos, they're creating their uh, brand. You, you know, so mm -hmm. all of these skills are so important that we encourage and nurture. And I think that's why, you know, arts is always this sort of, if you're not careful, tends to be quite sort of boxed, doesn't it? And I think we just need this really broad approach. I think one of the things that's helped us massively at Denby is our careers program. We know we, we, have, we have had industry experts coming in to talk. We have a huge um, alumni program now that, that, that's growing all the time where student, you know, last, last term we had a, a student who was doing a, an internship at ITV come in and talk about his experiences. You know, one who was applying to the BBC and had done various bits of work experience, but coming in and, and kind of opening the eyes of our children to yeah. these opportunities. And when it, when it's ex student, it's role modeling, isn't it? And they, they just, the aspirations are raised incredibly. No, absolutely. And that was one thing I wanted to pick up from what you said earlier. And I think it's so important. And again, in, in today's world to connect, if you like, the vocational outcome of, of these skills, of these artistic skills, the, the opportunities that it creates and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. anything from, you know, working in media through to game design and all that sort of stuff. And I, mm -hmm. I find often when I'm talking to audiences about this, that's the bit that 
not just the kids want to hear, but the parents want to hear too, because I think they're looking for confidence that their kids are acquiring skills that are going to really help them in, in their, you know, their future lives. It's it's so important. And, um, you know, turning those subjects really into a sort of career reality, uh, into uh, things that the parents can, can really see, um, you know, sort of, as you say, becoming viable vocational options. It is absolutely massive. When we've held her parent, um, sorry, we've held parental engagement sessions specifically for that, you know, and that's why we want to involve the parents so much. It's not just a case of coming and watching your your son or daughter perform. It's where can this go? Where can this lead them? What is available to them? Um, and we're working really hard at the moment to uh, to sort of kind of take those next steps. No, exactly. Uh, Erin, look, that's absolutely wonderful. And it's so great to hear such a sort of a joined up approach, but also coming from the leadership as well. I think that's that's really, really fantastic. I know you're going to be back with us uh, for the panel discussion. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to move on to our next contestant. So thanks, Erin. Uh, wonderful. And our next uh, contestant is uh, Genevieve Smith Noons, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge and currently looking at where the worlds of classical ballet and computer science collide. Uh, Genevieve, how lovely to have you with us. How are you doing? <laughs> I, I'm OK. Um, I'm a little bit sore. I had spinal surgery yesterday, so I'm actually in bed. <laughs> oh my god as you do you, oh jesus um I'm well so listen full i have makeup if, like i've got like about 20 layers of makeup on. <laughs> See, well, the you, joys you... of technology the joys of technology means i can be here even though i'm actually in bed uh and recuperating so yeah and and not just a pajama day a proper a proper reason as well a real pajama day <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so listen, Genevieve, you've, you've again supplied, supplied us with a lovely video. So I'm just going to play that uh, for the audience and then we'll be right back with you. is all I can say about that, Jenny. That is just insane. Uh, t t tell me about that. All right. So um, it's very hard for people to understand the connection between classical ballet and programming. I probably should give a little bit of a background. My background comes in, I was a secondary computing and maths teacher um, up at, from 2004 till 2012. And then I moved to A-level and then in through to that 2017, I started working at the University of Roehampton. So uh, working in the computing education, PGC, and now I'm a digital media lecturer as well. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so that kind of gives you the background of why I'm interested in it. So there was no, no girls in it. Um, and I went to dancing school when I was little, so I could actually see how ballet could be turned into a programming language it has the same rules and structures that you get in a programming language such as python or java or yeah. whatever um so and it's as rigid it's incredibly rigid if you're looking at specifically classical ballet Con contemporary less so it's actually interesting folk dancing is probably the closest to programming languages alongside classical ballet whereas things like argentine tango have steps but no rules um, so there's lots of interesting things where I looked at why, which forms of dance could we look at um, in order to kind of embody, um, it's called tacit somatic knowledge and it's how you kind of embody learning through movement. 
And it's wow. a really good way for your brain to store information. A bit like Maya's multimedia theory of why you have kind of dual channel coding and things like that. So, Well, yeah, obviously. Um, that was what I was going to say the first minute you said it. <laughs> no, but it's actually really interesting if you look. It's the things like having the labels underneath our, with our names on our, and us talking. So it's that, that kind of information. Um, but so this is the fourth ballet that I'm doing. Um, I did the very first ballet in 2014 when we brought out the new uh, curriculum, the new program of study for England. Um, and then the second ballet was all about data transmission and, and viruses. So we the ballet represented that and we had data visualization and projection mapping. The third ballet was about chronic pain and biomedical engineering. So we looked at the pain gate system and and performed that in a sense and we had um some small biometric sensors on the dancers to represent pain signals and things and then the next ballet uh, was supposed to be a mixed reality one or extra reality whatever you want to call it these days they like changing their names don't they um and <laughs> um covid happened which meant i had to flip the whole thing to virtual uh which is actually quite as you to move the technology along. So we're doing a, a full AR classical ballet and we're using video technology like this to uh, capture the dancer's data and turn it into 3D models in real time. So yeah, it's called um, mocap.net and some of the Spanish um, academics develop an algorithm for it. Yeah, and what's the reception been, you know, when you're talking to people about building this, how do people <laughs> react to it? I mean, I'm, you know, generally it's just, it's amazing. Um, it's either that or what? <laughs> it's the, um, mm, so yeah, so it's in, they, it's in, if you just kind of say it, they don't get it as much as watching it, I would say. Um, one thing we have noticed with the data of people coming to watch the live performances, we tend to get a much higher male audience for a classical ballet performance than you would do normally. Um, so it might be the dads taking their kids as opposed to their mums. Um, right. that happens that kind of thing so we have a much higher male audience rating which is good yeah. because it's so ballet is interesting in terms of it's accessible for people in terms of going to study it um you know yeah. loads of people will have done it but it's actually feels quite elitist to go and watch it so yeah. there's another barrier there that we're trying to break down but the fact that you can actually dance and use your own data to generate the visuals, generate the music. This is what we're doing this time around. So we're using the brainwave data and the biometric data to, in a sense, encode um, the 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 score for the ballet. So things like Sonic Pi will use. Um, yeah, yeah. You can also, and also you can. What's the word? Uh, you can sonify, sonify um, your brainwave data in Python and things like that. So we use. We don't use like. We always use simple technology that you could find in the high street. Um, yeah. So we'll only ever use like one connect that you get off eBay, like not like a, you know, a full developer's kit. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that we, we had, like we have kind of gone into purchasing um, and that is the emotive brainwave headset. Um, but the yeah. guys at emotive are really helpful and really interested in what I'm doing. So they, you know, anytime I have a little bit of a problem, I can just get in touch and they'll kind of try and help me out. Um, but it's beautiful. It's like that, that brainwave where it said Nora ethics is actually mine. They're my brainwaves. That's, that's so. just, it's, it's beautiful, incredible. isn't it? it? Isn't it? And this is what I love. And I sort of, I talk to people about this. So, so my deal is, is AI. I spend a lot of time talking about yeah. AI and, you know, AI in itself is, is not creative, right? It's not creative. It just follows a pattern that it's been told to pan. But the creativity comes when you start to harness that to do to do creative things. That, that's the yeah. that's the magic for me. Um, yeah. And so it really is just trying to sort of uh, bring that to life. Now, now you, you sort of mentioned it at the beginning of our conversation as as a way of sort of getting more girls into technology. Have, have you what, what's been the impact of I guess of, of the diversification of your audience? Well, it's uh, this, uh, yeah. So it's more about widening participation as opposed to just girls. This is the the kind of difference. So when we did the very first ballet, um, we had like the whole computer science class getting involved. So all the dancers are always amateurs and always students. It's because everyone's learning, and it's about it's a that's what computer science is. It's about learning and being creative. It's not about being professional and accurate. Kind of, yeah, it is as yeah. well. But it's that kind of. So for me, it really has to be with young people. 
So, yeah, yeah. But you, what you've just captured there is something that I think is missed a lot. Um, and, and look, the, the, lots of computer scientists are, are massively creative and they will see that creativity. But often when you're teaching computer science, you know, you're teaching this sort of cold binary logic and, and the colour and the beauty of, of what it you know, can do in the hands of people like you is it's lost. And I think it's such a tragedy because we, we, we need creative programmers, but actually I don't need them, you know, sat in the dev team. I, I need them all around the world doing in, in every, you know, walk of mm -hmm. life, bringing the kind of magic that you're showing there um, to, <laughs> to everything that we do, just to, to light up, you know, data is such a beautiful thing, isn't it? When, when you it can is. see it. Um, and so it's just great to be able to do that. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I want to do it is uh, um, you were talking about this earlier about the world um, that there are children are going to and doesn't exist yet. And one of those big things is data ethics um, and understanding and ownership of our data. So to be able to explore your brainwaves is quite a an intimate thing. Um, and what does you know, what are the percent, what are the premises, pitfalls and potentials of that are quite, you know, quite exciting, but also can be quite scary. We're getting the, the students to then explore it and understand what are the challenges and potentials of it then they are going into the world armed f to develop a better future that's kind of like what how i see it i mean it seems a bit you know oh my god wow but it's more to do with actually just giving them the uh, opportunity to take this abstract and make it more concrete but, but but it's but it's also doing it in a way that brings it to life. I, I've always I've long yeah. held the belief that it's it's always a dangerous experiment trying to combine the worlds of art and science. And and Lord knows, uh, you know, as scientists, <laughs> right, a, fa a family of scientists will go to the sort of, and it's often when the, the art guys are trying to, you know, bring science into what they're doing, and it just genuinely you just think, oh God, no, please just yeah. stop. Um, but, but but actually it's also doing it in a way which is positive and, and creative. So it's not, mm -hmm. you know, let, let's talk about the problem of a world full with data and what that will be. <laughs> and now think about what will happen when your brain is connected. What kind, you know, yeah. we don't need to do that. Science fiction will do that for us, right? What yeah, we actually need to do. Well. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. But what we need is someone who's going to say, hey, kids, look at what we could do with this. What kind of a world would you build if this was possible? And that's the bit where the lot, for me, the lights go on and the eyes go wide and they start and, and we get beyond, you know, the obvious kids, the kids who are, oh, you know, of course, of course you'd be into this because you like technology, but we get the quiet ones at the back who sort of maybe lack the yeah. confidence, but, but want to be mm. involved. That's why I think it's such a rich approach. Yeah. And it's, it's also uh, one of the other things that, um, I found is that they feel like the arts is a space to be both kind of brave and take risks as you know, instead of a, sp a safe space, it's a brave space. Um, and, and, and that kind of failure that we build in with computer science is kind of similar. So, and obviously for me, I brought, you know, I'm 45. So the ability to, you know, it was a hundred lines of code and then you will make one mistake. And then you were like, ah, Dr. Jobs back again, yeah. a page, you know, I want to play my dragon 32. Um, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so we, you have that built in, whereas now it's this like instantaneous thing, but I, I love it though. There's so many creative things, you know, like Fortnite creative, is amazing yeah. um any of the free world spaces like um minecraft but i'm also loving adobe aero um so and they've just brought out their beta desktop and i love that because it's actually just stuck to ios at the moment and i like yeah. it when we can expand and teach um but we also have to have ways that aren't required with so much technology you know so we can actually yeah. include the whole world uh, and not just those that can afford it no, no, exactly, exactly. Listen, Genevieve, that's absolutely yes. wonderful. And and I, I, I know we're going to get to you on the panel as well. Um, ladies and gentlemen, could you just give me a minute? We need to do some technical things in the background, uh, which I think uh, we'll just see. And it, there we go. I've just seen him run from the entire opposite side uh, of the room. We are going <laughs> to let him catch his breath. And I'm going to introduce our next guest, who is uh, Mr. Ian Phillips, who is, uh, in, uh, from my perspective, is the architect uh, of the event that we are now enjoying. And by the way, if you are enjoying, please do uh, join in the conversation online. We would love to get some likes or even some dislikes if you're not happy. Let us know what we can do better as we go through. Uh, smash that like button. Uh, give us a subscribe as well while you're there. Why not? Because you know, it's Friday night, sort of fill your boots. Ian, uh, without further ado, 
take us where we uh, where we were. I was just telling you where we left off. Where we left off, we, I was just saying that Genevieve came. It, there was an event. It was a micro bit of launch. And Genevieve came to talk to 200 boys. And they sat there while she showed her video and talked about stuff. I think some bit went over their heads. Some bit went in. But they had their mouths wide open. And that's the sort of inspirational moments we want to give people where they think, yeah. I need to understand this more. I, I don't, I think I get it, but I want to understand this. And I think that's part of what we're doing. Um, it, it absolutely is. And look, for me, it, if, 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 if the inspiration isn't there, we're not creating the, the momentum. We're not breaking the inertia, if you like, in those young minds to want to embrace more and to want to engage more and learn about what this can do for them. I, I had this boy, Dave, um, he, he represented the country in chess and he represented the country in the International Olympia, right? And I had nothing to do with it, right? He obviously got an A star in computer science, but I had nothing to do with it. I said to him, what do I need to do? How do, I, how do I get more kids switched on like you? He's so humble, lovely guy. The funny thing was today, he was, he's, I always said he's a developer. He was back helping the boys on a Zoom call today, Teams call, um, helping the boys to develop so they can be good at it, right? Yeah. This kid, he said, get in early. Start as early as you can to inspire, to switch people on. Because he'd had experiences, one of his uncles had switched on. And, and that, yeah. that's what I've tried to do is after that lesson I got from him, I've tried to help kids find their, that catalyst, that, that on and off switch that says, hey, this life, it's an amazing thing. How do I, how do I make the most of it? No, I, th I think that's right. And, and, and it's that hook, isn't it? It's that spark. And, it, and it's also, um, you know, showing people. That, that, that how you can apply these skills i mean it's a bit like i was always grateful one of my son's art teachers um you know and, and look my son is a, a lot like me we are terrible at what people might think about tradi traditional art so we can't draw our handwriting's atrocious um but you know you stick us in front of photoshop or you know illustrator you know we're not bad um and it was the teacher that was just unable able to see that that my son's canvas was a was a computer um and then taught him all about andy warhol and pop art and all that sort of stuff but it, it, it gave you know his his lights went on that was the bit that i loved about that what can we do in to to encourage more teachers to be able to think laterally like that um it's, it's what you know we, we we've raised our our hat we've raised our aspirations to what ken sir ken left us you know and that's all of ken's stories are all about moments of clarification catalytic moments you can call them anything but it's where people get switched on so for me it's about creating situations outside the norm i think we've been talking about one of the negative things about covid there's nothing to look forward to there's none yeah. of those oh let's look forward to this let's look forward to that and and what i've been lucky to do and, and i've put a lot of this on the website so that people can look at these. I've run lots of events where you take kids out of their comfort zone. You, you put them into situations where they switch on just like they do and interact with each other and they can interact with adults from outside. So we've been really lucky and I think one of the great things and something I, obviously we're all grateful for today. I mean, like I Sam's provide us all with a bottle of wine. Great guys. And, but it's these industry partnerships. It's us working yeah. together with industry that have really switched on. So when I, when I did the microbit launch, I had 23 people come into school to work with 155 kids. Yeah. These were 23 people whose job on a day-to-day -day basis was something to do with com computer science. Yeah. And if you can't, if you can't get those inspirational moments, because then the boys would be working. They, one of these guys would sidle up and say, hey, so what are you doing? They'd start a conversation. And, and yeah. it's those magic moments. I was really lucky. I got to do a sabbatical to wander around the States for three months looking at all the best schools in the States. And it was just a wonderful opportunity to step back after 30 years of teaching and actually think about what it was I'd been doing all that time. And I came back and I thought, there's only one thing we need to do. We need to kick 
we need to create authentic, engaging events that boys will feel are relevant to their lives, they'll engage in, and then I can wander along the side and talk to them and find yeah. out about them. It, it, uh, absolutely. It's that facilitation that's done the job for me. And it's really, you know, I'm at the end of my career now, but I really feel like I'm at the start because I think I've discovered what is the, the key. And it's so easy this afternoon teaching you non-boards. It's so easy to find a key with a kid. And then all of a sudden you can see his face like that. And he thinks, I'm going to do that this weekend. No, but, but look, this, this is the thing. And this is what I love that has been consistent in, in everybody in the conversation this afternoon is it, it's not about the technology. Do, do you know what I mean? You know, it's, it's not about learning to code. It, it, it's, it's about what you can create with it. It's the end result. And this is why I, I think, you know, the world needs more initiatives like that. And especially, I mean, it was lovely to hear from Genevieve and her approach and how we're approaching some of the diversity issues. And, and it's not just gender, it's the whole spectrum of diversity yeah. that we've got to think about. But we attract more people, not just into the industry, but we give people more confidence with digital skills if we help them make something achieve something technology is at the heart of it but it's not the focal point for, for me it's it, it's it's just it's a gateway to getting at things that, that we couldn't have done on our own you know Jeanette Wing she said you know, yeah we will not need everyone to be a computer scientist but we yeah. need everyone to understand computational thinking that's just yeah. how to break down problems into small chunks so that you can solve them we need everyone to understand abstraction how you can solve one problem in one way and then solve a different problem in the same way. We need the principles of computer science. Yeah. We just don't need a, we don't need a world full of computer science. No, this is this is it. And the other thing for me is about confidence. Um, and, and some of the work that I'm doing at the moment is trying to connect. You know, it's really funny when you look at all these different government reports and, and from around the world, but specifically in the UK, and they point to this sort of dearth of digital skills in the workforce. They point to the opportunity for what digital skills can bring a modern society. For every pound we spend on digital skills, the economy receives £10. You know, all this stuff. And then you look back at what's happening, you know, in primary, secondary, and also further and higher education, and they're not being taught. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just like, oh my God. And and so this is the bit for me, and I know, you know, that the work that you and Ty have been doing around sort of developing digital ed education is a huge part of, you know, I don't care what you choose to do as a vocation. My job for my industry is to make sure that you're confident enough with technology to make whatever that is better. That's that's the opportunity for me. And I think that's why creativity becomes so important as a vector to deliver that. Well, creativity is an enabler, isn't it? it? It sort of lubricates the situation. I think, you know, this work a day approach, you know, you could, kids will just turn up for lessons and teachers, if teachers are being creative with their process, that will enable them to inspire themselves. Not only then, they can inspire others. And the same for kids. If, if it's a creative process, the kids will inspire each other and they'll inspire the teacher. I, you know, Ty Goddard will often say, it's easy for me because I teach in a Ponce school where, you know, <laughs> there aren't any you know. <laughs> And, you know, there is an element of that that is absolutely correct. Um, and you've been here, Dave, you, you know, it's, yeah. it's a nice school. But I would argue that every, every person wants to do well. Every yeah. person wants to learn. And there's stuff that gets in the way. And I'm not naive. I, I understand there are real things that get in the way of them learning. Big issues. But I also know, and we've all read the stories, we've watched the film, you know, where you see someone gets the other side of that. And I guarantee that creativity and inspiration, they are important factors, as well as compassion, kindness, all love, all that stuff. All of that stuff is what gets in the mix. And the bottom line in all this stuff, well, there's two things. One is relationship. You yeah. know, and we are really lucky in this country. We've got some amazing teachers who have amazing relationships with young people that can turn those switches. And, and I think there's another thing um, that, that I didn't get for a while. And I was lucky I went to a Google thing in Amsterdam a couple of years ago. And the woman from Finland who was re-engineering the curriculum was there. And she talked about the cohort. Now, I've, I've read quite a bit about it since. And, and obviously, New Zealand is quite big on co-authoring. So that means 
you negotiate with the young person to work for the company. Wow. Okay. And so we've been playing around with this in the year nine as I was teaching this afternoon. All of their work is co-authored. Now that doesn't mean they can, some of them this afternoon, Friday afternoon, they were thinking, oh, that means I can, no, no, that, you tell me what you're going to do. We'll negotiate and I'll keep a check on it. And that's my job. I'll make sure and you'll document it and you and, but it's your work. This is what you said you want to do. And that's very, very powerful agent in all this. Um, yeah. And I, as I said, we're still exploring it here, but I really feel that it's big returns, very big returns. No, exactly, exactly. Look, Ian, uh, two special thank yous. Um, one, you know, for bringing us that insight, but two, more importantly, for bringing this group of people together. We're, you know, getting to nearly halfway through. We've got one more participant to come to. We're going to take a short break just to grab a drink uh, and to set up for the panel discussion. Uh, Ian, thank you again for organising this and for joining us. Oh, it's a great trip. And Dave, what a guy. What a guy. Yeah. <laughs> You've been the lubricant. And, 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 and it's nice that Ty Goddard is going to interview you later. And I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be yeah, cool, no. isn't it? He's going yeah, to give me you too. a hard time. You know that. I, I hope so. I hope so. I hope he's had his hair cut this time. Well, I, I, me too. I hope he's got his lights sorted. <laughs> yeah. All right. Brilliant. Thanks, Ian. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And thank you so much for bearing with us for the technical problems. Uh, that is our world now. It used to be the train was delayed. Uh, you know, uh, now it's like, I'm sorry, we're late. Uh, Windows needed an update. Um, so we are through to our final contestant, ladies and gentlemen, Nick Corston. So I am not going to read a long introduction out for Nick because I can see him waiting in the wings. And so I'm going to jump straight to him. Nick, how the devil are you? Very, very, very good, actually. How are you going? <laughs> This was back in the summer. Go the lockdown. and build the banner. So, uh, people, put your banners down. Use your arms to, to put pass the banner across, just like in a football match. After three, two, one. Okay, start to pass it. So this is the happy team in the summer. Oh, that's a bit better. <laughs> I hope that works. I hope you could hear something there. Basically, back in the summer, we got a grant from the Arts Council. We got a grant from and some sponsorship from LGFL, John Jackson and his team, and we built a green screen studio. We were streaming all summer. This was the launch of our month-long UK art takeover. And here I am in front of old Winston Churchill here. And he said during the war, you've probably heard this one, when they were wondering where to spend money on tanks or the arts, he said, well, if we cut the budget for the arts, what's it all for? And I'm actually here in, in Parliament Square at the moment because we've had our, our pyramid stage. We built a half-side cardboard pyramid stage for an event back in the summer. And we had it up at BBC Television Centre this week where we celebrated the life where we celebrated the inspiration of this wonderful man, Sir Ken Robinson, who I know you've been talking about a lot today. And we announced a podcast series, the Talk Walkers, hashtag Talk Walkers 22 podcast series in memory of Sir Ken Robinson, where we're getting some people who work with him to share their memories, to share their experiences of this amazing man. I know you all know that the line in his talk was, creativity is now as important as literacy, quite contentious to some people quite contentious to some people who thought that that was bringing creativity, that literacy down to where they had creativity. In fact, oh no, it was bringing creativity up to where we have and really need to keep literacy. But I tell you what, if you're a young person with special needs and you're never going to be able to read, you aren't going to be able to access texts, then maybe creativity is more important than literacy. And that's really the, the contention that Sir Ken had in his talk there. So, Pyramid stage in Parliament Square, what's that all about? Well, back in the summer with our Arts Council grant, we built a cardboard pyramid stage in the playing fields of Brooklyn's Academy, Brookside Academy, down there, just down the road from the Glastonbury Festival. And we ran a festival for three days. We had Glenn Matlock from Sex Pistols, Martin and Gary Ware talking about how a 20 pence a week drama club literally changed their lives. We had a dad and his daughter playing. We had little Lenny from Leeds. He's got um, cerebral palsy. 
and he can't hold a pencil. He can't hold a knife and fork, but he plays the piano every day. And if you want heartwarming every morning, you want to be doing that. So here I am in Parliament Square, as I said, and we've been really been talking about what I see, not just creativity, not just tech, not just people, but this thing called art, because for us, art is the combination of creativity, technology and people, creativity, tools and people, because let's face it, technology is only a tool that was invented since you were born. Ask Ty Goddard, he knows all about that. Art, as Seth Godin said, is what we call it when what we do might connect us to somebody else. And at Steamco, this non-profit community enterprise that I started in my son's primary 10 years ago, which I gave my career up five years ago to roll out across the country, we connect our kids with their art and our communities with their schools because we want to help our kids aim high, whether their art is painting or photography, whether their art is dancing or design like Morag Myerskoff here or DJing. Whether it's fashion or football, whether it's cooking or coding, we have got to help our young people find their passion, find something they can be excited about. It might make them a little bit of money. It might make them a lot of money. It might help them make a few friends. It might help them make the world a better place. And that's why we're so passionate about art that we've got the T-shirts. The art of robots. I love this. I'm always a bit wary showing this to a bunch of tech heads like Ty Goddard's crew. But that is a, you know that, Ty, that's a 15-year-old Lego Mindstorms 2.0 robot, 50 quid on eBay now. But that blows people away because that will do a Rubik's Cube in two minutes. The latest one that David's developed will do it in two and a half, three and a half seconds. Robots, rockets, we make rockets, we fire rockets, we get the whole community. And we talk about Stevenson's rocket as well, George Stevenson's rocket. But most importantly for us, this is about art for all, giving every young person access to art and creativity. And quite frankly, that's what this is all about. That's my mission. It's been to connect our kids with their art and our communities with their schools, working with fantastic schools across the country. Fourth to the 6th of December, we're doing a three day festival, a bit like Glastonbury, but we're going to be doing a real festival with Chris Dyson, that amazing head teacher up there at Parkham's Primary in Leeds. So that's the end of my two, three minute pitch. It's probably about 20. I don't know if, um, if Dave's still there. He I'm, I'm still there. there, Nick. No, that was abs absolutely wonderful, my friend. And uh, look, how, how is the, um, what's the reaction been to all of this, Nick? I mean, it's certainly like you, you were a tour de force and what you're doing is so creative. Do, do people get it? Does, do they, does it take a long time for you to sort of help them understand? Lots of questions in there, Dave. Blimey, I should have made notes. Um, <laughs> what's the reaction? How often have you mentioned Sir Ken Robinson's name to somebody in a, an education environment? And what was the reaction? Would you say there's a Marmite kind of vibe going on there? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's the point. There, there, is, such, there is such polarization in, in many cases in education, particularly the more vocal Twitter crowd, if you like, the education Twitter. There seems to be this left, right, right, wrong, black, white traditionalist, progressive, whatever you want to call it. And I think most of the educators I meet, actually, who aren't on Twitter, just want to get on with it in the middle, what, what we call that 80% that in the middle. So I think the, the point is, it seems to have almost been weaponized for whatever reason. But when, when I, I think the people I care about are parents, teachers, and carers, creative carers in communities. Because when we speak to them and talk about access to art, access to creativity, giving the, their kids the skills they will need to outpace those robots, they start nodding. They think, yeah, this is something I want. Do you know what I mean? So I don't care what the policymakers think necessarily, as long yeah. as they get policy right occasionally. I don't care what educative Twitter thinks on its extremes. I care what that 80% in the middle, parents, creative carers and teachers yeah. and leaders are thinking. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And it's one of the reasons why I started doing a lot more um, engagement from, from a kid side, because like from an AI perspective, the thing that I found was really curious was parents get this message about AI, they get it from two places, they get it from the media, you know, the robots are going to take our jobs, or they get it from uh, uh, pop culture. So they get a, they get a black mirror. So whenever we talk about technology, it's black mirror, or, you know, some kind of technology dystopia. And it's so frustrating, because then you see parents start to become fearful of technology, or oh, I'm worried about how much screen time our kids are having. And I'm oh, it's a very dangerous place. And oh, you know, and in reality, what we need to do is to inspire people, isn't it? It's, it's connecting people, and especially parents giving them the confidence that actually, you know, we talk about, um, 
uh, you, you know, uh, running faster than the robots. But actually, in reality, it, it's standing on the shoulders of the robots. Like for me, it's being able to achieve more as a result of harnessing the best of technology capability with the best of human ability. That's that's the blend where I think it starts to be become so important. And that's where I guess the connection for you to make that connection. I, I love this whole sort of perspective of art for all and, and really making that accessible. And I think that really seems to be right at the nub of what we've been talking about today. Is, is that a difficult message to get across or is that something that everybody goes, well, yeah, of course. Well, it's an interesting one, actually, because we started Steam Co on the back of the C word creativity. And, and that often takes a bit of explaining to people. So we, we decided to go down the art route on the back of that Seth Godin phrase, the connection, because when you say to somebody that art, you see them glazing over, but then you say is what we call it when what we do might connect us. You start tapping into that passion. What Ken Robinson called their element, in fact. Yeah. And, and, and I think I've found my element, which is running around like a nutcase, inspiring and connecting and a bit like you with the tech. And, and, and I think for me, the biggest, the biggest and most important word here is education. It's educating everybody. It's educating parents. It's educating teachers. It's educating policymakers. You know, Mr. Gibb, I know I've, met, I've spoken to him several times. He's very passionate about art and creativity and music and invests in them appropriately. His budgets are limited and there are aspects of policy that make it difficult to roll out. Everybody really is into it, but I, I, I believe people have to be educated to see the impact because we have research and we could show Mr. Gibb and, and Ken Robinson did it. A talk he did at the, the, the Place Dance Centre that dance and maths have a synergy. There's a lot to be learned and you can actually get academic uplift when you have yeah. a rich, broad and balanced curriculum that offers something to every child. The whole school will come up academically and, and yeah. not everybody has to be crammed in to be this rocket science academic, you know. And, and no, that's exactly. not what we have to do. And the CBI are realising that, the government are realising that. We need to educate for the jobs that we have, not just this narrow niche of, of academia. Sorry, David, I, I talked to you. No, no, no. Those, you know, look, we're absolutely on the same page. And, and Nick, I know that we, we had some comms uh, troubles earlier when you were dialing in, but that's exactly what uh, Genevieve was talking about as well, was sort of widening of that and, and opening out. Um, so, look, uh, we need to sort of uh, wrap up, Nick, but talk to me about what's next for you. What's the? You, you've mentioned a couple of big projects. What have you got coming up? Gosh, yeah, well, what's next? We've got this um, autumn tour. Every time John Lewis issue an ad, we tend to sort of get kicked off on some sort of crazy activity. <laughs> and I didn't realise their ad was coming out today. Um, two, two years ago, the, the Elton John ad came out. I ripped it off, put some subtitles on, stuck it back on YouTube. Elton John retweeted it, 50,000 likes in an hour, and I went off for two weeks. So <laughs> I'm going to be doing the same thing. We're, we're going to be doing a UK tour of schools, doing assemblies live streamed. We can go into schools and take all our kit there. Or we can stream from here, as I know you do. And then we've got this three-day festival of creativity up there in Leeds. We've got some amazing bands, performances, kids' workshops. Friday's Kids' Day, Saturday's Parents' Day, Sunday's Grandparents' Day. But it's a bit of something for everybody over the weekend. So that's really what we're looking forward to. And between me and you, we're not building a cardboard pyramid stage. We're building a cardboard Tracy Island. I don't know if you're old enough to remember Thunderbirds. <laughs> and we're going to build a cardboard robot. And it's actually going to take off. And not a cardboard rocket. It's going to take off in a puff of smoke on the Sunday. It's all going to be done in computer graphics, but don't tell oh, anybody our secrets. That's, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. We will not tell anybody. I absolutely love that for two reasons. One, because you think I look young enough not to remember Thunderbirds. Uh, two, because it's bloody Thunderbirds. That's fantastic. Can't be nothing to, nothing wrong with Thunderbirds, is there? And, and I think that's that old school analog stuff. You get kids making rockets, you film it with iPads, you code it with... Blah, blah, blah. You bet. We've got to access education and bring it to life, haven't we? And it's not about blackboards. No, totally, totally. Uh, look, Nick, that's absolutely fantastic. I know you're going to be joining us for the second half of the panel discussion, so we'll see you again later. But thank you, uh, Nick, thank you. so Is much for taking time. Have got the right now or tomorrow? <laughs> 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 I've got one in the fridge, you right. Beer o'clock in my house. <laughs> all right good stuff good stuff thanks nick thanks. okay then ladies and gentlemen this is how it's going to play out we are going to take a short five minute break um and so we're going to see you back here at 11 minutes past five that's how precise we are on this show go and get a drink go and stretch your legs do all the things you know you should do don't just sit there looking at the screen going through your email uh, take a walk around come back refreshed and we'll see you back for the panel discussion thank you <laughs>